After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside, and he took her hand, and he helped her sit up, and the fever left her. And she prepared a meal for them. That evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and he went out into an isolated place to pray, and later Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go to other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence so far in this, in this service. I was just overwhelmed with, with the newer song, Father, that we, that we learned that this idea that when death was arrested, that our heart was free. Oh, your power is real. And this morning, I just pray that you would help us to understand that. And that through your power and through your passion and, and, and through your purposes, we would grasp a hold of who you are and what you really want to do in our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of tired of hearing people say um, that uh, they're, they're going to pray for you. Well, that sounds kind of odd from a, from a pastor, but, but, uh, but uh, whenever we have these, these great tragedies in our country and and whenever there are different things coming up, the first thing people say is, I'm going to pray for you. And what we begin to see here lately is, is that the rest of the world, is, with, with all the different tragedies that have come about, and, and the first thing that people begin to say after these things happen is, hey, we're going to pray for you. The rest of the world who do not know Jesus are starting to say things like, that doesn't do anything for me. I don't want your prayers because bad things keep happening. And people on the outside looking in don't, don't often see um, the, the power of prayer. And, and then when we're confronted with that as Christians, and somebody says something like that to us, we say, well, I'm going to pray for you anyway. I'm going to pray for you. And, and those are things that we were taught to say. And, and so don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying that we shouldn't tell people that we're praying for them. I should, I'm not telling you that, that we shouldn't pray for people. But what I'm saying is that we need to understand that if we're going to pray for people, then at some point we need to expect God to do something. You see, at some point, prayer has to be more than something we do. Prayer needs to be something that we participate in. To participate in in the power of God. To to come to a place where when we hear a, a song that talks about that when death was arrested, my heart was made free. To understand the power of that statement. To understand that, that God has, has not only the ability to, to heal us physically and, and to make the real world right, but he has the ability to transform us at, at our very core. And folks, that's what we should get excited about. And that's when praying for people matters. That's when when we have have different uh, things that are going on in our world. We say we're going to pray. We just need to be honest. I'm not so much praying for the people that are struggling with whatever it is that they're struggling with. I'm praying for the radical transformation 
the radical transformation of the world. And so when you ask the question sometimes, and at the end of the day, at the end of our, our time together today, we're going to have a time of healing, and, and, and we're going we're to pray for healing. But, but here's the thing, is that healing itself is not the goal. See, I remember very well uh, watching my mom when she was in her, her early 40s. And, and, and I remember my mom getting the news that, uh, that she uh, had cancer. And how even though she went to church, and even though she believed that God could heal, and even though all those things were very real to her, she was scared. And she struggled. And part of the reason for that is her mom uh, died of cancer. And, and, and so she was struggling with these, these images of what that looked like. And, and I can remember going to the doctors. And I can remember her praying with her, her group of, 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 of friends. And they would come to her and they would say, hey, we're praying for you. And she would say, oh, thank you. But nothing was happening. Until one night uh, we were at a service and it was much like what we're going to be doing here at the end of our time together today. And, and, and at the end of that service, uh, the pastor said we're going to do a time of healing. Now part of the reason we struggle with these kinds of things is because of what we see on TV. I'm just going to be honest. And, and please, if you're offended, I apologize, but um, I don't. Some of the things that we see on TV and when it comes to healing services, we make healing a spectacle. And we take off a coat and we wave it at a crowd and they all fall over. You come up there and, 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 they, and, they, and they take their coat off and he just swings it back and forth and people are slayed in the spirit and, and all of a sudden they're healed and... And we have all these things that, that we see that, that happen. And, and so when we talk about healing, we, as Christians, we kind of back off of that because that's what we see. And so when we get into the scripture today, we're going to point out that's exactly what, what Jesus was trying to guard against. He was trying to guard against, when we talk about healing, this idea, this idea that healing is for me. He was trying to guard against this idea that, that the healing that, that takes place is for the individual. And so at the end of the service so with my mom, I, I can remember because I was sitting there watching and I was kind of weirded out by it all because I was like, wow, I've seen things on TV. Is this the way it's going to be? I've never really seen a healing service. But then I watched as, as the pastor and a group of people uh, gathered around my mom standing in front of an altar. And they took uh, some oil and they, and, they, and, they, and they anointed her. And they gathered and they prayed a prayer of faith around her. And it was over. She didn't fall backwards. She didn't do anything crazy. But two days later, in her doctor's appointment, the cancer was gone. And granted, when my mom was seeking after healing, she was seeking after healing because she was scared. She was seeking after healing because she needed that in her life. But the result of that was you couldn't shut her up. You see, the result of that is, is uh, she was a, a hairdresser at the time, and if you're going to sit in her, if you're going to sit in her chair, she's going to talk to you about being healed. She was going to talk to you about uh, not only being healed, but talk to you about this salvation experience that she that she had received and how God was real to her life, and and she did that uh, for years as a hairstylist, and then she went from from being a hairstylist to my mom and, and dad owned a pizza shop for a little while, and and anybody that walked into the pizza shop, uh, if you walked in there a couple of times, she would start to talk to you, uh, find ways to talk to you about faith and the message of Christ, and 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 then. 
she would work it in there if it was appropriate, how, how God touched her and God healed her. And, and, and so they did that. And then she went from there to working in the office of uh, the Texas Department of, uh, of, of Corrections and Justice. They changed that so many times, so I have to remember uh, the, the title of that as I'm, as I'm preaching. And so she would talk to people and she would connect with them and, and she would talk to them about Jesus. And, and then 22 years after she was healed from cancer, she died from cancer. Did it come back? Did not change the fact that she was healed. You've heard me say this before in, in a moment of honesty with my mom and I. She was really struggling with this idea of, hey, I was healed from cancer and now I've got cancer again. What's going on? And my response to my mom during that time was, Mom, everybody that Jesus ever healed died. Because healing is not the point. So the result of that, 22 years later, was a little Nazarene church in Huntsville, Texas, packed to standing room only. With people that she had done her hair and she had changed their life by introducing them to Jesus. To hairdressers that worked for her that their lives were radically changed because of their connection to my mom. To rich and to poor, to, to, to directors within the Texas Department of Corrections, some of the, the head honcho guys sitting next to some of these correctional officers, to, to, to the people uh, who you would never put any of these people together in one room in any other, in any other reason. And they, and they sat for over an hour when, when, we, when we opened up the, the mics for people to come and, and to talk about the difference that my mom made in their life. They didn't talk about what a great hairdresser she was. They didn't talk about what great pizza they made. They didn't talk about uh, uh, what a great uh, worker she was. They talked about how she used her healing of 22 years prior to make a difference in their life. You see, healing is not a me-me proposition. And the motivation of God's people when seeking healing or seeking after the gift of healing matters. See, there's two things at work, and this is what makes this, this, this passage different, and I'm trying to set it up as best as I can. There is a difference in the way that a believer approaches healing in the way that a non-believer approaches healing. And just for the purposes right now, and I'll try to go back and forth if you can stick with me a little bit, but, but as a believer, when we come to be healed, if we've accepted Christ as our Savior and we have this life-changing uh, life moment in our life, our motivation to come to be healed can't be about me. I am convinced that's why we don't see some of the, some of the overwhelming healing that, that, we, that we see in, in Scripture with, within, within the church sometimes. You have people that are coming that love Jesus. They know who He is. They know His power. They know all of that. But they're still coming and saying, Lord, I just, man, I, I, just heal me so that I can go through and, and, and live my life and do the things that I want to do. And, and, and we want to do those things. But they're not coming and saying, Lord, here I am. Heal me so that my healing can matter to somebody else. And it has to be more than lip service. See, the crazy thing about that is, is even as I say that, we're, we're kind of um, mulling around in our minds, some of us, well, yeah, I can say that. But out of, out of our heart is where our, our words have to come from. 
You know, there has to be this sense that, that you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come and I'm going to receive this healing, but, but this healing ultimately is going to glorify God. It's not going to glorify the act of healing. Now, a non-Christian doesn't have that background. A non-believer is coming because they're scared to death, literally. And they hear that God has power, and they hear that, that we, can, we can pray, the prayer of faith, and, and healing can happen. And here is the crazy thing about that. It can happen for them. Because of our faith. Right? But again, the healing itself is not preeminent. It's, it's how God is, is, is elevated. And as we read the scripture this morning, we, we see that, that God doesn't heal us for our sake. He, he, he heals us uh, not so that we can feel better. In fact, the healing that we receive is not for us at all. The first thing uh, that uh, happened to, to, to Simon's uh, mother-in-law, what, what was the first thing that she did when she received healing? She got up and she served. She got up and she, she made food for, for Jesus. She, she got up and, and at this time, just, just to kind of set the scene a little bit, Jesus, it hadn't been that long ago that Jesus had been, had been baptized uh, by John the Baptist, and Jesus had, 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 had called his first disciples, which is who we're talking about with, with, with Andrew and, and Simon and, and all the people that we've talked about in this, in this particular passage. And, and then he began to, 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 to take, to exercise uh, demons from people and, and began this, this, uh, this ministry uh, to transform people. And so you had her, the first disciples, you know, there Simon and, and all the people that were connected uh, with that household. They believed in Jesus. They had watched all this stuff. And so when they come running uh, to, 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 the, to the house to eat, um, I really love how this is put. It says, after Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. This is after they had watched him already do some of this and they told Jesus about her right away we've seen what you could do with everybody else we believe now you can do it for her whose faith won out in that moment she was sick in bed she hadn't seen any of that The faith that went out was, was because of what they had seen. James and John and Simon and Andrew. And, and so they, they told Jesus about her. And Jesus picked her up uh, by her hand. And she went out and, and began to prepare a meal for her. For, for, for everybody. She wasn't going to waste this opportunity. Uh, she was going to, to serve with all that she had. And when you look at all of the... Uh, the, the times when, when, when Jesus healed people, um, that was kind of a pretty normal reaction of gratitude. Their, their relationship with, with, with Jesus began to be strengthened. Their belief in God began to be strengthened. They went out and they began to speak about what Jesus had done and the power of God, even when Jesus told them not to. When Jesus told the lepers, don't tell anybody, just go to, to, to the temple and, and, and do the things you're supposed to do to give thanks to God for that because we want God to get the glory for that. They didn't, never wanted healing to be the centerpiece. But they told anyway. They couldn't help it. They were like my mom. They couldn't shut up about it. And then when we keep going in verse 32, it says that evening after sunset, uh, many people uh, were, were came to them that were sick and demon-possessed, and they were brought to Jesus, and, and the whole town gathered at the door to watch. Now, again, there's a little bit difference between now, then and now. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Jesus has to do something to prove that his message is worth hearing. And because humans are humans, it took a supernatural act. 
And so he, he began to heal those people. He began to call out the demons. And, and because the demons knew who he was, he didn't allow them to speak. And, and then we, we move on down to verse 35. Before daybreak the next morning, after all this had happened, Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. And later, Simon and the others went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Not to hear the message, but to be healed. See, this is where the healing thing gets dicey. Because even in the church, you know, we, we, we can all remember, when we, we're in a good series of messages or if we're in revival, I, I can remember the days of two and three week long revivals. I'm that old. I can remember those days. And we want those things to last because, man, there's such this wonderful feeling. The only problem with that is, is that is that's never what, what Jesus intended for the message to be about. He, the message was never about the meeting. The message was never about the healing. The message was about Jesus in a world that was in need and that we were supposed to get what we got and go out and give it away and exalt God, exalt Jesus. And so we would be tempted in this, in this particular situation to take a look at this and, and say, you know what, this is great. We just want to keep doing it. And, and I'm sure that's what Simon was thinking. Man, we've got to keep healing people. People are needing to come. And, and everybody's looking for Jesus to heal. And Jesus, understanding that this is going to become a problem, says this in verse 38. We must go on to other towns as well. And I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Anything strike you funny with that, with what Jesus said? As we're talking about healing, even where we're leading up to in this service, Jesus didn't say, I came to heal. He's glad to do it. He's able to do it. He wants to do it. But the message was preeminent. That's what he wanted. And so what we see here is a very important part. And we need to, a very, very, very important point. And we as believers need to grasp hold of this. There is no such thing as an individual healing. My mom's healing wasn't for her. It was for the countless numbers of people that she was able to bring the message of Jesus to. You with me? Now, now sorry, that doesn't mean that, that God doesn't want to heal you. And I think this is, some of us like, wow, it just kind of takes all the fun out of it. But does it? Or does the fun really start? The idea that what God has done in you, he now gives you the not only responsibility, but the ability to take to the rest of the world. You see, healing is meant for everyone to see the power and the goodness of God. Healing is, is meant for everyone to see that, that they can be encouraged uh, by seeing God exalted. Healing is meant for the reengagement of God's people in the mission of God. Healing is meant to be shared with the world. But as believers, we need to seek healing to share healing. And not just physical. You see, we have to resolve to make sure that the message of Jesus Christ accompanies 
healing. I have a high school friend of mine who recently posted, your prayers won't fix it and it's not going to be okay. And when I first read it, it hurt me. Because he, one, he knows I read that. I know he's probably not living for the Lord. As a matter of fact, I know he's not um, li- living for the Lord. But he's among that group of people. And, and at first, I got kind of put off by it and upset. even thought about, I'm just going to unfriend you. Because we can do that, right? But then it kind of hit me. When was the last time my friend saw the power of God demonstrated? I want you to think for a moment what it would be like if our prayers for people's healing were more than a platitude. If it was more than something that it was, it was more than something that we did, but it was something that we were engaged in. What if when we were praying, we, we just decided, you know what, Lord, I, I really believe that you can heal my friend. What if we were praying for the next uh, tragedy? Because there will be another one. That we believed that the power of God could be manifested in the middle of that. And what if that started here in Broken Arrow Church of the Nazarene? What if that started with a group of people that, that here in a few moments, who, as they made their way to a chair for healing, realized that the healing that they were about to receive was not just for them. That it was for the entire world. What if our minds shifted from... From, from what about me, and we talked about this several, several weeks ago, and Jesus fixed me, Jesus helped me, Jesus. What if we, because when we do that, it just boggles my mind sometimes, because when we do that, it's like, it's like we don't believe that the first time that we prayed, he didn't hear us. As a youth pastor, I would get this all the time. I'd have kids, and, and uh, we'd go to camp. And camp is wonderful, and we should send kids to camp. And they would have this wonderful altar experience on Thursday. And then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they're good. And then there's Sunday, oh, I wish I could go back to camp. God heard me there. And then maybe three months later, they're like, I don't know. Father, you know, I need you, I need you to save me. And, and, and every once in a while, I would have to grab a hold of one of those kids and say, he already did that. You don't have to ask him that a thousand times. Your next step is, is, Lord, give me your power. Your next step is starting to make choices with his help. To, to follow. And then your next step is, is, is to take that message out to everybody else. Sometimes I think as Christians, we need to stop asking God to do something that he's already done. And that's why, you know, when we do these kinds of things, that's why whenever whenever we we ask people to pray, and and, and maybe maybe we, and and I think there are times for for wonderful outflows of emotion. I'm all for that. I I think there's, when when we were singing today, I, I had those times. But that was never what it was about. The thing that should fuel those outpouring, those, those moments of, of outpouring of emotion or what, the assurance of what God's already done in your heart. And today as we get ready to, to seek after healing, part of what you're going to have to do is when you get up from that chair, is you're going to have to accept the fact that God heard you. That 
And then you're just going to walk and let God do what he does. That's the hardest part. We all want the lightning bolt experience, and a couple of you might have it. Chances are some of you will just feel something a little bit different. And to be honest with you, that's where most of us are. And that's okay. But it's what you do with that healing once it's over that makes the difference. You see, healing is a gift that God gives us so that we can proclaim the awesomeness of God to whoever we come across whenever we come across them. So who were your healing before today? Who will stand to fall in love with Jesus because you exalted what God did in your life to them? James chapter 5, starting at verse 13, it says this. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. One of the things that we're going to be praying for is there's some of you that don't need a physical healing. There might be some of you that need emotional healing. You got some stuff going on that nobody really knows about. You've been wrestling with it. You've been asking God to take it away. And today can be your moment. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. We've done that. Are any of you sick? You should call the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. There's some of us here today that have physical healing that we need. Some are dealing with cancer. Some are dealing with heart disease. Some are dealing with joint issues. These, this isn't a word of knowledge. This is, I know you. Okay, I'm not, I'm not pulling this, hey, somebody's got this. In, in a crowd this size, that's, I could do that and be right, couldn't I? That's just true. There's some of us that are dealing with some physical issues that we have. And, and even as I've been talking about this, there's part of you that says, oh, man, wouldn't it be great? But I don't know. If I go out there, somebody might know that there's something wrong with me. They already know because you've told them. Some of you need a physical healing. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. And the Lord will make you well. I love how that reads. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Some of you have some spiritual healing that you need to take place. You have sin in your life. Now let me tell you what the bigger sin might be. I'm not saying you're a morally bad person. I'm saying some of you have idols in your life other than God. Money, power, sex. Yeah, I said it. And there's some of us that need to have that taken away. We need to have a spiritual healing. And those prayers, <laughs> those prayers make a difference. Verse 17, Elijah was human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. 
My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Your healing is not for you. 